Here begins the fifth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I notice that many of our regulars are absent today, and I wonder if this reading scared them all away. <laughs> to those of you who have come, wonderful to have you here. To those of you who may be watching at home, be brave. It's going to be just fine. And if you know someone who chickened out, Tell them that this entire lesson actually ended up being non-toxic. So, there you go. Hebrews is one of my favorites. I often tell people if I were forced to make a choice about two or three books of the Bible that I would absolutely want to have with me on the proverbial desert island in case I would go over my baggage limit by having a, a huge Bible, I tell them, I tell them three and it's going to reveal a lot about me, at least to the clergy and others who, who know these scriptures. One is the Gospel of John. The second is Revelation, more John. And the third is Hebrews, because in my opinion, Hebrews ties Revelation and the Gospel together and sets the whole thing as the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament expectations. So those three things I would take away with me and you can think whatever you want to me about, uh, about me for that, but that's, that's where I am. John Batters just laughed. Yes. Who wrote Hebrews? One of the great questions of the last 500 years. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked because it, it's worth thinking about. One of the things that most scholars agree about today and many preachers reject is that Paul almost certainly did not write this letter. Although for centuries, from the, from the apostolic days, uh, the patristic days, there were early references to this being one of Paul's letters. But remember, they didn't have Wikipedia. They couldn't go and go online and say, who wrote this? They, they taught what they heard, and they taught what was common in the day. But the evidence from the text itself and the way it's written and the things that are in it and the vocabulary and the rest, particularly the vocabulary, which is very elevated, uh, indicate that it's somebody else. And there are other suggested people who could be the writer in a, a large number of commentaries. The one, the suggestion I like best and I've, I've read at least two or three good commentaries that make this case, is that it was none other than Paul's buddy Apollos, from who's, who is mentioned in Corinthians. Apollos was an educated Greek. This is educated theological language. Apollos was a Jew who also understood all of the, the Jewish scripture back and forth. And 
at the top of my study here today, I picked a little piece out just hoping that I might get to talk about Apollos a bit. Uh, this is from Bishop Hugh Montefiore, who was an English bishop. He's long dead now, but he wrote an exquisitely good commentary on Hebrews back in 1964, and it's all but forgotten and, and rarely studied by young seminarians these days because it's so long ago. But I being stuck in the past, at least according to some people's estimations, think that 1964 is still recent. I was 14 years old then, and heavens, I'm only 39 now, so this has really gone well. But read what he says. Let me read this aloud in case the, the folks who are watching us don't hit, have it. The epistle to the Hebrews confronts us with a rare instance of fresh, creative thinking by an individual of the early Christian church. His argument is grounded in detailed knowledge of the scriptures, sustained by the logical thinking of a forceful and rigorous intellect, and expressed with the elegance and precision of a cultured Hellenist. Someone from, not from Palestine, but someone who was from the larger Greek-Roman world of the time. And in this commentary, and I, I have a PDF copy of it if you'd like to read it, there is, he makes an extensive argument for, for why he thinks it's Apollos. Yes? Uh, I read somewhere that this predates the gospel. Is that your... It could. It could. And, it, and it, I can tell you it almost certainly predates uh, the gospel of John because, well, just about everybody believes it. It's later. But he doesn't, he doesn't have the developed thinking that John does about the pre-existence of Christ, which, which is, you know, the logos, the things that we learn in chapter 1 of John about Christ being from the beginning, having always been there, begotten of the Father, God from God. All of those things that we say in the creed tend to rely on the first chapter of John for their biblical proof. And he doesn't see it quite that way. He, well, and we'll get to, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back to that when we get down to the verse here that, that is about that very subject. So, uh, but yes, I think it, it certainly predates John, uh, and it may predate the others. Those, those dating of the Gospels is, you know, really, everybody has an opinion about that, just like they think they, everybody has an opinion about who wrote Hebrews. So the, but I think it's fair to say that he does not have this idea of the eternal being of Jesus Christ, uh, sec second person of the Trinity from before all time and forever in quite the same way at all that John does. And I'll, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But uh, so anyway, well, let's just look at the questions that I put down here. These questions are brilliant and challenging. And if you can't answer them, I won't be surprised. Uh, according to verse 1, where does one go if you want to find a high priest or recruit a high priest, got a job opening? Where do you go to find a high priest? Mere mortals. Mere mortals. Anyone seems to be eligible. So it, it's, it's taken, they're from mankind. And that is, that's a key point here, that uh, the, the role of the high priest is to be put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf. The there is us, the people of the world. And that means that the priest has to be representative, has to be coming from the number being represented. So that's, that's the first question. Uh, what is the primary work of a high priest? Offering gifts and sacrifices, on, uh, sacrifices for sin and gifts. The, the two phrases there, gifts is one thing, sacrifices for sin is another. The gifts are things like the thank offerings that we read about in the Old Testament. When you've got your harvest coming in and you bring and you present all of the, the first fruits and that sort of thing. Gifts on behalf of various reasons are dictated in the Old Testament law. The sacrifices for sin are an important category, and that's just two different things. Sin offerings, right. Uh, and, and then, what is it that makes a high priest, this is question two, 
What is it that makes a high priest able to deal with the ignorant and the wayward? That's us. He is one of them. Exactly. That this is all part of the importance of being representative, but he deals with the ignorant and wayward because he himself has those same weaknesses. So that's, that's the second thing. And then finally, three, uh, for whom then does the high priest offer sacrifices for sin in verse 3? For himself and for everyone. If you have studied the ritual of the Day of Atonement ever in your Bible studies, you will remember that there are two successive sacrifices that day. The high priest offers a sacrifice for himself and his family, and then offers a whole sacrifice for all of the rest of the people. So this is an example of what Bishop Montefiore says at the beginning of how thoroughly acquainted the writer is, whether it's Apollos or whether it's actually Paul or someone unnamed, someone actually very familiar with the Old Testament rules and regulations about the Day of Atonement. So, that's important. Uh, he offers sacrifices for himself and for others. So then, uh, what condition must be met? This is question four about verse four. What condition must be met before one can presume to become a high priest? You must be called by God to do that. And he talks about just as Aaron was. Aaron, and yes, The, the, Aaron, uh, the, the call of Aaron to be the, the priest and his descendants, that they, they become the tribe of Levi, and you've got, the, you've got the, uh, the, the Levitical priesthood and the rest, it's all mixed up together, and I can't tell you right now because I'd have to look it up to see where that particular title comes from, but what he's talking about here is the decisive and clear call of God, either to the, to the tribe, and this is, an, this is an interesting thing about Jesus' priesthood, and we'll get to this in a little while. Jesus is not from the tribe of the priests. He is not from the tribe of Levi. He is from Judah. The, Judah. Thank you, Carissa. Good morning. <laughs> he is from Judah, which early opponents of the mission and gospel pointed out he doesn't meet the qualifications but by the time by the time Jesus is in his ministry in the flesh as it says in in the reading uh, in the days of his flesh the whole idea of the priesthood deriving from Aaron and his descendants had faded out and local local rulers of the day the local even the bogus kings of Jesus's day would choose the high priest. And it didn't matter whether they were, who they were even. It, didn't, it no longer mattered whether the kings were in the proper line or not. Rome installed who they wanted to. The, and the high priest had, none of that was going in Jesus' day the way it was laid out in those early books of the Old Testament, which would have been a great answer for someone who said Jesus isn't from the tribe of, of uh, Levi, and then the answer would have been, well, so neither is the present high priest. You're not worrying about that, but you know, nobody wants to have something thrown back in their face saying, but what about that? So, that, but that's, that's, those are good observations because he is not by that, but we're going we're gonna to remedy that here in just a second. So, but uh, the, the condition is that you have to be called by God. In our church, no one self-appoints to be a priest. We are all tested. We, we sense that God has called us, but then we also have to test that against the whole vision of the church as well. And if the, I, I can tell you the story of a bishop in Southwest Florida that I served under who said that a man came into him one day very much full of the Holy Spirit and maybe a little full of himself. And he said to the Bishop of Southwest Florida, 
the Holy Spirit has told me that I'm going to be a priest here in Tampa. And the Bishop of Southwest Florida looked at him and said, Holy Spirit told you that. He says, yes. And he says, funny, I'm his local representative, and he hasn't said a word about it to me. <laughs> we test our vocations, and we, and we test the call of God. And that's what, that's what the writer here is going to do, is going to prove to us all how Jesus got his call. So one does not presume to take this honor, but only takes it when when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest. This is verse 5. And, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Does anybody know where that particular phrase comes from in the Psalms? I think it's Psalm 2. Not sure about that, but I think it is. Carissa's going to check that out for me. But that's a quotation from a psalm. Well, that reminds me of um, the same principle. Just that reference. Probably. Uh, probably not necessarily to the Messiah, but Christians read the psalms and go back and discover a, a level of allegorical meaning that can point us there. And this, this writer did the same thing. He, he looks at it in the same way and sees and just assumes that the right understanding of the psalm that he quotes from, did you find it yet? Is it in? It, two seven. Two uh, seven. That he applies that verse to Jesus without any hesitation. Now he's, and he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to try to make the case in the, in the wider world, but he's writing to Christians and so he just makes the assumption the teaching of the apostles was that. And where do you think they got the idea that Jesus is referenced in the Psalms? Where do you think those original apostles got that? Did they, were they sitting around in a group study like this and saying, well, I wonder if? No, because in the Gospel of Luke, remember the story of the road to Emmaus. And he specifically Luke writes specifically in his gospel that Jesus opened the Psalms and the books of Moses and the prophets to show them how they pointed to him. So when, when, you, when you hear an early Christian writer saying, Psalm 2, verse 7, is about Jesus and it's it's words spoken by the Father to Jesus, then you can probably count on that coming from apostolic teaching, the teaching of the Twelve at first and then handed on to them. We don't make up the idea of finding Jesus in the Old Testament. We, we get it from Jesus' greatest Bible study ever on the day of the resurrection on the road to Emmaus when he sits down and teaches those two disciples. And they say, didn't our hearts burn within us as he taught the scriptures? And then they recognize him, and, and he goes away. But they go back and report this and, and tell everything that they've learned. So I, I consider that to be a key way for us to be able to know with confidence that when we find the prophecies about Jesus, when we find uh, things like these two psalm quotations today, that they are reliable. They are reliable because they come to us right out of the apostolic experience of those disciples on the road to Emmaus and, and the twelve who become the great spreaders of, of the truth. So he, he, he says, Christ didn't get this by himself, but, he, but it was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now that's, that is one of these places where we can probably count on this being earlier than the Gospel of John because he absolutely, this, this writer, Apollos, I'm going to say, or Paul or whoever, Apollos absolutely understands the high priesthood of Jesus begins at the incarnation with his coming into the flesh, but he doesn't necessarily have a full understanding 
of the eternal life of the second person of the Trinity, the Word who was always with the Father. That's theological insight that the Spirit reveals over time and gets crystallized in the Gospel of John. But may, this may indicate that he, he's just not thinking about that. He's definitely thinking about the days of, of his flesh. He says as much here. But he's not, he's not trying to unravel the mystery of the Trinity. They have barely only begun to grasp that there's an issue of trying to unravel it at this point. And it takes 300 years to get a council that unravels it finally, or at least thinks they did. Yes? It could mean that. You do. And, and, and some of the Arians were very quick to look at this and, and make that point, but the church overrules it. Because you can't expound one piece of scripture against another one. You've got to harmonize them. And if, if you pick and choose, you can build a case for anything. Look at the recent moral teaching of the Episcopal Church. You can pick and choose and say, this doesn't matter and this doesn't mean what you think it does. And then you can end up with strange teaching. So, yeah, but it, it, it is a problem. If it were the only piece of scripture that there were, it would be. But it, we offset this with the insights of John and the insights in Philippians, for example, where he says, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death on the cross. He didn't count equality with God, something to be grasped. There, there's all kinds of additional information in the New Testament. So you, you don't want to build your whole theology of who Jesus is based on this one particular book. Is that, does that answer you? Is, did that, I just, I'll keep talking until you say, okay, give up. <laughs> okay. Uh, in this verse, who is the one who said to Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you? That would be, that would be the father uh, speaking in uh, to the Son. And then I said, does this remind you of words from the gospel that are recorded as part of the baptism of Jesus? Those are, those are all related texts, and if you, if you want to make that the day that the baptism, the day that Jesus gets promoted to be the Son of God, if you only read the stories of Jesus' baptism, you might be able to think that was what it is. But there is much more particularly in the Gospel of John that sets it straight. I think that one of the reasons that John's Gospel was written was to correct the insufficient understandings of the earlier Gospels. As an eyewitness, John was able to say, yes, but there's much more here. And he includes a number of things that aren't part of it. So that's, a whole, that's another interesting subject for a whole other kind of Bible study. But I'm going to run out of time if I don't keep moving here. Uh, in, uh, where, the, where do the words, this is six, where do the words, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, come from? That's Psalm, that's Psalm 110. Uh, and it is in Genesis. The, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek is referenced in Genesis. He comes uh, kind of out of nowhere. Abraham is on his way to uh, further adventure with Sodom and Gomorrah. The priest of Salem, who was also the king of Salem, and Salem is, Salem is the, the, uh, a derivation of the word shalom and of peace, and it, has, it may have something to do with the city that we all know as Jerusalem. Interesting symbols in that Genesis account. Because he's, yes, I'm sorry. The question was, why, why does Melchizedek get elevated to being a high priest? I think it says he's the priest and the king of Salem in Genesis. The idea of his being a high priest what has to do with holding both royal and religious authority. And the idea of, of 
High priest is sort of assumed in that old one. It's not, it's not talked that way. But the designation of high priest underwent enough changes that it was the common and, and singular reference, particularly for one who is, as Jesus is, both king and priest at the same time. So that, that explains... Right, so he just refers to him as a high priest, even though the, uh, the psalm text doesn't call him that, but the writer did what he wanted to do. It's like my teaching this morning. I'm going to say what I want to, and you can talk about it the rest of the week or forget it. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> but good, it's a good, excellent question, uh, because it isn't a designation that's in the old one. Amy. Priest of the Most High God, I believe, is what it says uh, in, in Genesis. He comes out and he holds up bread and wine, which ought to sort of ring a bell for Christians and be suggestive of something. A little, a little. And then later on in Hebrews, and I'm sorry that our lectionary reading is not going to give you, uh, it, it's in chapter 7, it, it's not going to give you the things about the, the, the elaborated information that he gives, that the writer gives. But one of the things he says is, this priest, uh, Melchizedek, doesn't have a mother or a father, has no tribal relationships, nobody knows where he came from, nobody knows where he went. And one of the commentaries that I read had a piece from one of the early church fathers, a fourth century writer, and he said, Jesus fits that description perfectly in his, in the way the, the phrasing was, in his divine generation, begotten of the Father before all time and all of that in the creed, there is no mother. And in the incarnation of Jesus in the flesh, there is no father. And he doesn't have lineage that fits the priesthood and so on. This was Gregory of Nyssa who was writing that sort of thing. So the early church had zero trouble applying this whole mystery image to Jesus. And it's just sort of an assumed thing. Ed. Is that the Hebrews for everyone version? Yeah. Yes. Those are, that's a very good, uh, a good resource. The whole whatever Bible book for everyone that Wright wrote is, is very good. Yeah, New, Testament New Testament for everyone. Um, in, in chapter 7, and verse 7, or cha question 7, why do you think, uh, let's look at this, in the days of his flesh, that means while he was with us, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Why do you think the author of Hebrews described Jesus' prayers as taking place in the days of his flesh? It's to make his prayer like ours, to, to be a prayer from a human person. And that's why, and I, then I, I just said, can you think of times when you can know times when Jesus prayed with tears and loud cries and things like that. I, they're in the garden, exactly. And weeping in grief at the death of Lazarus, his friend. There is human emotion in Jesus' prayer. Amy. I, so much, I, I would have done so much for you. I would have gathered you in like a, a hen with her chicks and all of that. Yeah, his, his emotional depth in his prayer is without, without any question. It's absolutely the truth. Yes, yes. Yeah, 
he, he was a, uh, he knew how to laugh and cry very well, I suspect. Uh, can you think of examples of the obedient attitude of Jesus in the gospel? I think this is probably the, the greatest example of it is, is the garden where he says, take this cup away from me, yet not my will but yours be done. There's a lot of speculation. The, the, the translation uh, that we're using, the New Revised Standard, the last half of verse 7, he was heard because of his reverent submission. That is the, the because of and the, what follows is translated lots of different ways. Lots of different ways. And they all, they're all okay. Bishop Montefiore in his ancient 1964 version of commentary on Hebrews says that he thinks, and I, I should tell you that Bishop Montefiore was a Jew before he was a Christian. Uh, he, he thinks and believes that the right translation is he was heard and set free from fear, which I think is wonderful. And then he goes on to demonstrate that Jesus, after the prayer in the garden, there's no hesitation, there's no fear, there's no lashing out, there are no more loud cries and the rest. And he thinks that that's what it means when he goes on in verse 9 down here and says, having been made perfect, what he believes, this is, this is the commentary I used for this, he believes that part of that perfection is Jesus growing through his human fear and his human desires and submitting all of that to God in obedience. So that's, you can read that into he was heard because of his reverent submission, but he was heard but his prayer wasn't answered. He said, take this cup away from me. And he didn't get what he wanted. He, the, answer, the, answer was no. the answer was no. And that, that's crucial to our own spiritual growth and thinking because, let's see, can you think of examples? Obedience is a theme in 8 and 9. That's question 9. We're going to just skip that and go over. I think there's at least one more question on the back. No. Well, there are too many of these for me to go into it today. But uh, you can probably, based on what we did this morning, in the first going deeper, you can identify the qualifications for, for being a high priest. They are that you, you must be representative, you must be compassionate, and you can do that based on your own experience of knowing that you've got some of the same issues that those you're serving do, and that you have to be clearly called. Uh, so those are the three things. And, he lays out, the, the writer lays out the qualifications and then runs them in reverse, starts with the call and gets down to why Jesus is the ideal high priest. And I think that's really the whole point of this. Then he goes off in the next chapter, he spends some time on another subject, but in chapter 7, if you want to hear more about this teaching about the high priest, you'll have to study it on your own because... I'm going to get cut off if I keep talking. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to your word. Help us to open it with genuine understanding. Help us to appreciate the effort and the desire for those who wrote to give us everything that we need. And help us to be faithful to that witness as we appropriate this truth to our own lives. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.